process lateral to the ICA. So you make a small incision over the dural uh, periosteum, and we found some nice, soft, gelatinous tumor. And so you open the dura incrementally, uh, take a palpation with a disc, and then make a small incision and slowly widen the corridor. And eventually, the tumor was very cystic, soft, and suckable, and now we can use a 30-degree scope, look at the roof of the cavernous sinus. And now when we look medially, this is the corridor lateral to the carotid. So here you can see the course of the cavernous ICA, and uh, I think she had an intra-op CSF leak, so we repaired it with a flap. And here's the post-op scan. You can see the, there was a gross total resection with the six nerve palsy resolved. Here's another example of a recurrent pituitary adenoma previously treated at another institution. She was having progressive cranial nerve three through six palsies. And here we came in endonasally. We started working in the medial corridor. Now notice that there's some arterial bleeding here. So initially, you, you have the sense of uh, uh, worry that maybe there's this a carotid injury, but uh, always use your suction to locate the source of bleeding. So you can see that the bleeding is not very brisk. So this is just a small branch coming from the cavernous ICA. So if you encounter that, it's very easy to stop with a little surgicel and gentle uh, pressure, and the bleeding will stop. So once we stop the bleeding, we can go ahead and uh, We'll, we'll open the dura lateral to the carotid. You can see here's the tumor, very soft, uh, very favorable, very suckable. Uh, and we can slowly extend the incision after we've palpated and confirmed there's no vascular structure. And then because the tumor is soft and suckable, it's, it's favorable. You can see the ICA is now coming into view. Here's the ICA uh, making its turn. And we'll go ahead and now extend the incision and connect it. And so now we'll have full access of the cavernous ICA. And we'll use a curve suction. This is a curve suction going laterally. So here's the course coming anteriorly. The area that's most difficult to remove is the tumor as it exits the cavernous sinus posteriorly through the, uh, the ocular motor trigone. And um, I think endonasally, those, that area of tumor is hard to remove, so I, I generally don't. I'm not too aggressive with that. Uh, and here's the post-op scan. You see this little um, nodule? That's the tumor that's exiting the oculomotor trigone in the back of the cavernous sinus. In fact, Bill Caldwell published a paper about this, uh, this concept uh, about it two years ago. So the posterior cavernous sinus uh, is this area that's uh, above the vertical segment and uh, coming anteriorly. This is the area that's the supraposterior region of the cavernous sinus. And to access this area, what you have to do is you have to remove the posterior clinoid process. So here's an example of a chondrosarcoma. Uh, this is actually a, a midline chondrosarcoma. But notice how the chondrosarcoma is invading just behind the vertical periclival carotid. This is right in that uh, posterior superior compartment of the cavernous sinus, and so to get to that area, you have to remove the posterior clinoid. But in this case, the pathology has already performed the posterior clinoidectomy for you, so uh, a lot of times the, the pathology makes your surgery more favorable. So this is the, uh, the chondrosarcoma we're removing. This is the portion that's right in this, it presented itself in the sphenoid sinus, and uh, a portion of this tumor tends to be very calcified, so it's nice to use a caudal elevator. This is the cellar dura right here. So we are working all infracellar. So we'll go ahead and debulk all the tumor that's here. And now we're going to work laterally up into the right side where the tumor is now entering the cavernous sinus. So here's the vertical carotid. This is the portion that is eroding the posterior clinoid. So you have to be careful because the tumor has spicules of bone. And if, you keep, if you're not careful with rolling the tumor, that spicule of bone can puncture the carotid. So here's the vertical carotid. This is the posterior genu, roof of the cavernous sinus, and venous bleeding from the, from the cavernous sinus. So this is the, the access to the posterior cavernous sinus is the posterior clinoid, uh, clinoidectomy. And so we'll go ahead and drill the rest of this abnormal bone. We'll follow the vertical carotid down to the region of the uh, foramen lacerum 
And uh, this is an entirely extradural uh, approach, uh, no CSF leak, and the rest is just uh, polishing and removing the remainder of the abnormal bone. Here's the post-op scan, and she underwent radiation therapy. She's been recurrence-free for about six years now. Um, this is a case of the, uh, an unusual lesion. This ended up to be a dermoid tumor in Meckel's cave. So there's different ways to access Meckel's cave. Um, this is the front door to Meckel's cave. And the reason why we chose an anterior approach is look at the, the window that the tumor offers. You can see there's a, a huge window lateral to the carotid. So in these cases, you can consider an, an, an endonasal approach. So you have to do a partial transpterygoid approach to do this. You do a wide sphenoidotomy. We'll go ahead and uh, open up the periosteum over the region of the tumor. Here is the pterygopalatine uh, fossa. We've uh, ligated the sphenopalatine artery and uh, mobilized the uh, pterygopalatine ganglion. And when you drill off the top of the pterygoid, this gives you that more infralateral approach. And so we'll go ahead and open up the periosteum of the, um, of the uh, tumor. And immediately we see this uh, dermoid type uh, structures. This is a uh, uh, keratin uh, debris. And so it was very soft and suckable. And so we were able to remove this just with uh, just very gentle suction. So um, although you can consider transcranial approach for this, I think for this soft tumor, it's a, it's a very nice approach. You could see there's a, a little bit of calcium that's right inside the Meckel's cave, uh, some hyperostosis. So we'll go ahead and thin this down with a high-speed drill. And uh, this will allow us to look around this uh, piece of rock and uh, make sure that we clean out the, uh, the area. And here's the final view. There was a little bit of CSF uh, leaking from, from the back, so we had to pack this off with some, uh, some fat, a little bit of alloderm, and then uh, a nasal septal flap. And here's the post-op scan, complete removal, and she was neurologically intact. Another example of a, a Meckel's cave lesion are these schwannomas. Um, you can consider an open approach as well for this, and, but because, again, this had a nice presentation to the sphenoid sinus with a wide anterior corridor of access, we went ahead and, and did this through an endonasal approach. You can see here's the periosteum, and we'll open up the periosteum and then identify the tumor. Uh, we did use cranial nerve monitoring here, so we were able to monitor uh, cranial nerve six, and we were able to stimulate it. Here's the tumor finally isolated, and then here's the defect. You can see here's the vertical cavernous ICA, and here's the sixth nerve uh, that's stimulated. Um, this patient did well. She had a transient uh, sixth nerve palsy that resolved in three months, uh, but, uh, but a nice uh, complete removal and uh, neurologically intact ultimately. So I think the case that I would not consider endonasal are these dumbbell schwannomas with significant intradural extension. This is one that I would do a Kawasi approach, and um, I'm not going to show the whole video because I have a, a, a lecture on Kawasi's approach, I think, I think tomorrow or Friday. But uh, I'll just show you the highlights of uh, how to get to Meckel's cave posteriorly. So I showed you the endonasal front door to Meckel's cave, but the back door to Meckel's cave is this um, using the Kawasi's approach. And the way you do this is that uh, you open up the porous trigeminus sharply. And um, this allows you to uh, follow the trigeminal nerve through the porous trigeminus and uh, into Meckel's cave. So when you open up the fibrous ring, this allows you access into this Meckel's cave. So here's, here's the trigeminal nerve. We've opened up the, uh, the fibrous ring, and this is, this is all Meckel's cave medial to the Gasserian ganglion. And here's the post-op scan uh, with complete removal. So lastly, I'm just going to touch on the Petrus apex. So the Petrus apex, we normally think of when we lift up the temporal lobe and we see the Petrus apex medial to the carotid artery. So where that's the Kawasi's triangle, right? So we always wonder, where's Kawasi's triangle when we, uh, when we come in endonasally? So 
the region that, that would be would be right here medial to this vertical segment. And so you have a petrous uh, cholesterol granuloma here in the petrous apex. Notice how it presents itself nicely right in front of the sphenoid sinus. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry about the technical failure here. Okay, so this is a uh, cholesterol granuloma that presents itself right into the uh, back of the sphenoid sinus. So we're drilling uh, the, the infracellar clivus and we uncover the posterior fossa dura, but we also uncover the cyst wall. And there's good distance from the periclival carotid, so there's a safe window of access, and we'll use an angled scope. And uh, to treat these cholesterol granulomas, really what you need to do is you just need to open it widely, fenestrate it widely, and keep the cyst uh, open so it can continue to drain. I think some people favor very aggressive cyst wall resection. Um, I don't think that's necessary. I think that will result in more complication. But here you'll see um, what you want to do is you want to fenestrate it. And we'll go ahead and, and use an angled suction and then irrigate it widely. Um, and then once we uh, irrigate all the contents, we use a 70 degree scope. You can see the inside of the contents. And the way to keep this cyst open is you can use a nasal septal flap and put the flap so it goes right into the cyst wall. And what it does is the flap allows mucosalization of the cyst so that once it heals, it becomes one mucosalization cavity that goes right and drain, it drains right into the sphenoid sinus. And so to keep this flap adherent, what we'll do is we'll put some Surgicel and then we'll use a silastic sheet. This is like a Medtronic makes these silastic sheets. You roll it up like a cigarette and then once you put it into the cyst wall, it then opens up and it, it, it's, it acts like a stent to keep the flap adherent to the wall of the cyst. And then we'll leave this in for about two weeks and then when we take it out, you can see this is a, a three months post-op. She's been recurrence free for five years now. Notice this all drains into the sphenoid sinus. This is the enhancement of the flap. And what you'll see uh, in the office is this nice mucosalization of the cyst that was assisted, I believe, by the nasal septal flap. So uh, a very nice result. So when do you not do this for a cholesterol granuloma? Notice how this is a very large petroclival cholesterol granuloma. Again. The, 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 the decision making really is, is this going to be easy endonasally? Is there a good corridor? Here there's no good corridor because this is the prepontine CSF space. This is the periclival carotid. There's no safe window of access to do this. So the answer is easy. We do this from a middle fossa approach. Uh, I studied with Dr. Delashaw for one year and we published this uh, tech, his technique on using uh, an EVD catheter where you put it into the cyst and then drill a hole between V1 and V2 into the sphenoid sinus and allow this catheter to drain uh, into this area. So I, I uh, modified that technique and um, my ENT otologist likes to open up the mastoid on these cases. So we published this uh, double exhaust technique where we, do, we use the Delashaw technique but we put a second catheter from the mastoid cavity back into the cholesterol cyst. So this is a standard uh, middle fossa, transmastoid middle fossa technique. Uh, we'll elevate the temporal lobe dura, find the uh, GSPN, and then you'll see eventually we'll, here's the cyst wall. We're elevating the temporal lobe dura from the cyst. Now when you're doing this, it's important you don't want to get a CSF leak or a dural defect because you're going to drill a hole into the sphenoid sinus. So you don't want CSF 
You don't want to create a CSF fistula into this phenoid sinus. Here's the cholesterol cyst being removed. And uh, we'll resect a portion of the cyst wall. This is the lateral part of the cyst wall that was easy to remove. The medial part of the cyst wall is, is uh, very adherent to the posterior fossa dura. So that portion we won't remove, but we're just fenestrating this widely. We'll remove the cyst wall. And then here you can see the, the portion of the brain stem that was compressed. You'll see the posterior fossa dura uh, becoming reinflated. And then this is the last component of the cyst wall. So it's a partial resection of the cyst wall. This is the posterior fossa dura. This is the part of the CP angle that was compressed. And now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll find the area between V1 and V2. We'll drill a hole, small hole. This is now uh, entrance into the sphenoid sinus. And then we'll go ahead and thread the EVD catheter in and then uh, put a, a pericranial flap here. Uh, to finish it off. So this is the, the final view. This patient has been recurrence-free for seven years now, uh, so I think a very nice result. Uh, I'm going to skip this, uh, these cases for the interest of time. I think I'll talk about this on um, a separate lecture. These are just some chordoma chondrosarcoma cases, but I thank you for your attention. Thank you.